Hi, uh, my name is Zach Hershenson. I'm a personal injury attorney. I practice personal injury law uh, in Kent, Washington. Um, I am the founder uh, and owner of Hershenson Law, uh, which is located primarily in Kent, Washington, but we have two other offices, one in Graham, Washington, and another one in Ellensburg, Washington. Um, we have 11 staff, um, and currently we represent about 210 individuals who've been injured um, through the fault of others, primarily in car accidents, but also maritime injuries, trip and falls, dog bites, um, any number of different um, manner and mechanism of injuries. Um, and uh, so what I would like to talk about today uh, and this is not going to be an exhaustive discussion, but just uh, a brief summary of what can be expected when you file a lawsuit or when a lawsuit gets filed on your behalf. So this is uh, a little bit of background is what I'll do is a little bit of background on um, what's involved, uh, a little bit of background on what it is that makes it so that a lawsuit is necessary or what are the contexts in which a lawsuit is going to be uh, brought? When is it not? Um, and that sort of thing. And what you as a client might expect if a lawsuit happens, okay? So let me start first by just giving a little bit of background on the typical life of a personal injury case, okay? Um, we'll start out with a car crash because a car crash is probably the most common type of claim that um, I'm representing individuals on. Um, and so a car crash is first and foremost um, a very specific type of claim. Um, it can be differentiated from almost every other type of personal injury claim in the sense that uh, there are aspects of a car crash claim that make it a much less likely case to have a lawsuit filed in it okay so let's unpack that why is it why is it that a car crash is a case that is less likely to have a lawsuit than other types of personal injury cases okay well it works like this um, you get in a car accident there's usually two, at least two cars involved okay so you get in a car accident, there's two cars involved. And in most car accidents, most car crashes, um, there is actually not really any significant injuries, right? So imagine most people are getting in car crashes and nobody's injured, right? And so what ends up happening in those kind of car crashes is that there is a lot of money that needs to get exchanged in between the, the two, usually two insurance companies. So you get in a car accident, there's property damage, and there are two insurance companies. So there's insurance company one involved in the accident, insurance company two involved in the car accident. And those two insurance companies um, are going to have uh, the need to determine liability and they're needing to determine liability without a lawsuit okay and they need to do that because they need to know who who meaning which insurance company ultimately is going to have to pay for whatever damages gets paid for by the insurance company so um, there are really two types of insurance coverage that are at play when you get in a car accident there's first party coverage which is things like um, PIP coverage, personal injury protection, or collision coverage, which is coverage um, for property damage to your own vehicle, irrespective of fault. Um, and then there are third-party policies. So these are the liability policies. These are the policy coverages that provide coverage and protection for you when you're at fault. And ultimately, a lot of people don't necessarily know this, but ultimately, those two first party coverages, so FIP, PIP, for example, or property damage, um, underinsured motorist or collision coverage, those are paid usually on the front end by your own insurance company, but then they are paid back by 
the uh, liability coverage from the other parties coverage okay so because of those aspects of a car crash case the insurance industry so this are the personal lines insurance companies state farm geico progressive pemco amica mutual medium claw um, the list goes on and on these are the personal lines carriers uh, that are providing coverage for people who are driving around in their own vehicles in uh, Washington state and other states and it works similar throughout the United States. And they have entered into mutual agreements with the, um, the other insurance companies um, to submit their disputes to what's called intercompany arbitration. Okay. So what that means is that if there's a dispute between say Geico and state farm over who's at fault in an accident, they're insured or the other insured, that they've already preliminarily agreed that they're going to go to a process called intercompany arbitration for resolution of that dispute. So that's one factor that makes it so that a lawsuit is, un, is less likely or less necessary in, um, in a uh, personal injury map. Okay, so the other part is this. So you have that backdrop. First of all, Insurance companies need to resolve these disputes for their own interests because they need to be exchanging money in cases whether there's injuries or not, particularly the property damage. Insurance company one makes preliminary payments. They need to get paid back. They need to know who's at fault because ultimately the liability carrier is going to provide that actual money. So that's one factor. The other factor is that they have this thing called intercompany arbitration. So that's a backstop. So that if the claims adjusters who are adjusting liability start getting out of pocket and don't comply with the general rules of the road and when they in, in their evaluation of, of liability, then there's a process that's that's well short of a lawsuit that can adjudicate those disputes. So that means generally speaking, the claims adjusters for both of the two different insurance companies in the example that I gave are motivated to do things in a good faith manner um so that's another factor so that that's another factor that makes a lawsuit less necessary because of course because you have intercompany arbitration because intercompany arbitration is right there and readily accessible for the use of the claims adjuster if there is a dispute it's less likely that they actually have to use that right so that's another thing the other thing in a car crash which is to differentiate it from other types of injuries is that because of the way the rules of the road are written um, and the rules of the road are what govern car accidents and car crashes, um, they have liability break in one direction or another. In other words, you could have a situation where it seems as if, well, you know, boy, I don't know, that guy was going too fast and the other guy made an illegal left turn. So, mm, I mean, it really is like partly the guy moving. To, no, no, no. That's not the way it works. Rules of the road are going to set through exactly who's at fault. So if you have someone who's in a failure to yield situation, that person's at fault. They're going to be 100% at fault. Um, the traveling too fast. Well, you know, like that's usually going to take second, you know, second step, second place for, you know, something like failure to yield. Failure to yield is going to trump over going too fast. Another example. How about somebody doing really stupid things and slam, like slamming on the brakes because uh, of something they thought they saw in front of them? The other, other guy runs into the rear end of them. doesn't matter. You know, generally speaking, it doesn't matter it, what the reason is that somebody slammed on their brakes. If the person runs into the back of their car, it's going to be the person's fault who ran into the back of the car. So, and especially, this is especially the case for a case that hasn't gone into litigation. So because of all of those factors, um, it is far less likely that cases get filed when they're car crash cases. And that's because if you get rid of liability, the only question that has to be resolved before a lawsuit is filed is how much, not whether. And that's not usually the case with almost every other type of personal injury case okay so that presents a situation where 
there is a really good chance if, for example, I'm representing you, me and the people here in this office who represent people who've been injured in car accidents are representing you, that there's going to be a point in your case where some money is going to be offered to you and you as the client are going to have to make a decision about whether or not you want a lawsuit, okay? Because it's going to be something of a choice. Um, now, while there's some cases where there's no no choice in the matter, meaning that like if you don't file a lawsuit, you're not going to get any money. Car crash cases usually they do have a choice, and the choice is the clients, right? And so that scenario begs the question, which I'm going to be attempting to answer today, which is what is it that a client can expect? when they file a lawsuit, okay? So it's important to understand what is gonna happen because you're gonna be the one who makes that decision. And a lot of times people don't know what to expect. All right, so let's start out. What is a lawsuit, okay? What is a lawsuit? A lawsuit is a process it's an administrative process that is designed to resolve disputes civil disputes okay and so in order to do that when you file a lawsuit you make certain allegations you make those allegations in what's called a complaint so what happens with the process is that you file a complaint in the court, whichever county that you, that the car accident took place or the county where the defendant is located, you file a complaint and then you serve that complaint along with a summons on the defendant. Okay. And the complaint is going to make all sorts of allegations about what the plaintiff thinks happened. The filing of the lawsuit with the court is going to give you a case schedule and a trial date. Um, and the serving of the complaint on the defendant is going to produce, uh, is going to start the lawsuit, right? So, and this is a, I'm going to simplify things because I don't want to take too much time. But you file this, the civil complaint, you're going to get a case scheduling order and a trial date. You're going to serve that on the defendant. And there is going to be, like I said, an administrative process that is started by that initiating document that is going to take the case from the beginning all the way to a hypothetical end at a trial date. Now, right now in King County, where which is where most of the cases that we have are filed, we're a year out from a trial date when you file the case. So you file the case, say on March 20th, 2024, you're going to get a trial date somewhere close to March 20th, 2025. And there's going to be a number of deadlines and things that need to get done before you actually go to trial. But focusing primarily on what the plaintiff needs to do um, is what this podcast is about or what the plaintiff is going to be asked to do. By way of background, the civil process is one where what has effectively been done by lawyers and judges who developed our system is to take what people would normally understand to be a trial, right, which is everybody goes into the courtroom, everyone who is a, of any relevance to the case that the plaintiff wants to present goes ahead and gets called up to the stand, they give testimony, the defense attorney uh, objects to questions that he doesn't like that the plaintiff lawyer is asking and asks the court to make rulings on those uh, those objections. And then the plaintiff sits down. The defense attorney will then cross-examine the witness who the plaintiff just presented. And then um, the two attorneys, both in their opening statements and in their closing remarks, will make arguments and propositions to the jury uh, that um, that they are trying to convince the jury to award damages, and the jury will award damages. What the civil system does is, short of the rulings from the judge 
and short of the jury is to take that whole process, right, of witness witnesses giving testimony um, and also, which is also a process at the trial of the exchange of documents or the presentation of evidence, all that is taken out and unpacked and spread out over a year, at least, of preliminary process, okay? So they say as well, um, just by way of context, uh, I looked this up during COVID, so it's probably a little bit old now, but in King County, um, in 20, it would have been, I think, 2019, or something in the order of 23,000 civil lawsuits filed. Now, not all of those were personal injury cases. Uh, some of them were probably divorces and contract disputes or um, things of that nature. But a lot of them were car crashes, a lot of them were personal injury cases. And if you've got 23,000 lawsuits filed in a given case, it's not plausible that you could actually conduct 23,000 uh, civil trials, right? And um, even before having 23,000 plus number, numbers of cases, you still had a situation where you wanted to have a, a method for getting claims resolved without having to go into the courtroom. And so that's where our civil justice system comes in. And that's where the federal rules of civil procedure and um, the Washington state rules of civil procedure come into play. So under those rules, there are essentially three mechanisms for exchanging documents or for gathering evidence in the form of testimony. And those are interrogatories, requests for production, and depositions, okay? And so those are the three main things that a plaintiff needs to participate in. Um, so the first of those is a deposition. And so a deposition, and we can, we'll talk about that in another podcast, what's the spec of a deposition. A deposition um, is a out of court process where a witness, the plaintiff, usually in this context, gives testimony about themselves and how this accident, how the accident they've been involved in affects them. Um, and so this is the biggest thing that needs to be done by a plaintiff in a lawsuit. So it usually takes anywhere from three. Um, sometimes it could take as much as eight hours, although it's very unusual in a car crash. I'd say the average is about two and a half to three hours for a deposition. And this is a situation where you're asked questions by a defense attorney. And, um, and so that's one of the things you need to do. Um, those are codified, the rules regarding depositions are codified in Civil Rule 30. Um, and that provides uh, the, the general guidelines for how a deposition is taken, how it, how it takes place. So that's one thing you have to do. The other thing was, uh, was something that I mentioned, which, was, which are interrogatories. Now, interrogatories are sworn uh, answers to written questions that get posed to you as a plaintiff. Um, and those are another thing that you need to do as a plaintiff. So, um, and in that context, what that means is you are going to be asked to cooperate with my staff in answering the questions that are posed. So, um, since it's King County, um, but very similar in other counties, there are what's called the, um, they're, they're basically style interrogatories or general order interrogatories. They're called different things in different uh, uh, different jurisdictions. But here in King County, I think they're, um, they're just referred to as the standard car crash interrogatories. I'm not really sure exactly what they call them, but these are interrogatories which have been accepted by uh, by the parties to be um, reasonable questions and they are the standard sort of interrogatories that are going to get sent out propounded on um, on plaintiffs and on the defendants in car crash cases and they're really basic types of questions right um, there these are interrogatories about what's your name identify all of the people who are participating in answering interrogatories are you a medicare beneficiary 
what's your employment history? Have you ever been arrested? Uh, have you been in other lawsuits? Have you ever been injured before in a lawsuit uh, and brought a claim? Have you ever been injured in a, uh, a workers' compensation claim? Did you take any drugs or alcohol before the accident? This sort of thing. It's a basic questionnaire, and your participation in the lawsuit is going to involve you working with the staff to answer these very straightforward type of questions. Most of the questions are answered from your biographical information that we've already gathered or from documents that we've already obtained. Um, so there's really, uh, it, it usually involves maybe half an hour, sometimes an hour, hour and a half, something like that uh, from the client. But that's another thing that's being asked of you is to answer these interrogatories. Now, I didn't mention this, but this is one, there's one other thing that oftentimes has to happen when you're involved in a lawsuit, and that is what's called a CR 35 examination. So a CR 35 examination, um, and I'll just read the rule for you. So a CR 35 examination, and the rule states as follows, order for examination. When the mental or physical condition, including the blood group of a party or of a person in the custody or under the legal control of the party is in controversy, the court in which this action is pending may order the party submit to a physical examination by a physician or mental examination by a physician or psychologist or to produce for examination the person in the party's custody or legal control. The order may only be made for good cause shown and upon notice to the person to be examined and to all parties and it shall specify the time, place, manner, conditions, and scope of the examination and the person or persons by whom it is to be made. So that's Civil Rule 35. Um, you can see that the rule is written in such a way, or you can hear that the rule is written in such a way so that um, the, the party who's seeking to have this examination performed needs to go to the court to get the order. As a practical matter, since these examinations happen in every single case, um, generally speaking, the, uh, the the plaintiff and I certainly am part of this is I would just generally stipulate to this taking place. And this is essentially the defendant's opportunity to have a doctor of their uh, selection make a to conduct an examination. And this is the main way that the defendants to defend these cases is they hire a, a physician who's extremely skeptical of a, a plaintiff's injuries um, and they basically will do their examination and usually they find very few injuries surprisingly enough uh, or or they find that there were injuries that were sustained but they've all been resolved uh, and the treatment that was uh, given to the client was was less than uh, was more than what they even needed they they're they're essentially, sort of a, a, a mix between, uh, well, it's sort of like, like a Helen Keller type of a medical examination. They can see nor hear nothing in terms of injury. Um, so that's, th those are really the three things that are gonna be asked of you as a plaintiff. Now, um, if the case goes to trial, that's a different story. If you go to trial, then there's a lot more that will be asked of you. But if the case isn't going to go to trial, it usually involves those three things. Um, like I said, just to recap, one, you got to sub submit yourself to a deposition, which is usually about three and a half hours of giving testimony. Um, so once, you know, looking at this from the perspective of the, of the client, it's really those three things. It is uh, participating in the process of answering the interrogatories and requests for production that are submitted to us by the point by the defense attorneys. It is uh, sitting for the plaintiff deposition, and that usually involves me preparing you for about three hours. Um, there's a video that we usually watch, um, and I go through um, and prepare the witness for questions, and then you have to sit down and answer questions. Sometimes that's three hours, and every once in a while, there's two instances where you do that. It happens very infrequently, but usually it's just sitting down for a deposition, giving testimony for three hours, something around that. 
and then submitting yourself to a what's called a CR35 examination. Now, um, those are the things that are asked of you by the defendant um, and the things that are asked of you by, by me. I will usually myself also have uh, a doctor of my choosing examine you. But that really is, um, is uh, you know, it's not necessarily uh, as... It's not it's not as uh, imposing as as the obviously having a, a doctor who's hired by the defense examine you. So really, those four things, um, and you could probably say uh, the CR thirty five examination and the examination by my own doctor. That's probably the biggest from a time perspective. So that's probably you know you got to go somewhere wherever that might be. Um, you have to be examined, then you have to travel back to your house. Um, so we'll just say that's in total, probably six hours for both of those two examinations. And then the interrogatories, responding to the interrogatories, maybe that's like an hour and a half, maybe two hours at the most. Um, the plaintiff deposition, say three hours of de giving deposition, three hours of of preparing so it's about six hours um these are the these are the things that would be asked of you in a situation where a lawsuit gets filed now now the oftentimes a lawsuit gets filed and the claim resolves so you don't have to do anything um sometimes it goes up to trial if it goes up to trial this would be pretty much the most that would be ever asked of you is these things. So it's important to know that as you kind of go into this, as you go into the decision-making process of whether you want to file a lawsuit, knowing that if you want more money, that there's essentially more work that has to be done. So um, again, this is Zach Hershenson, Hershenson Law. Um, we represent people who've been injured in car accidents, uh, slip and fall accidents, and dog bites among any number of other types of injuries. Um, and this has just been a little bit of background on um, what might be asked of you when a lawsuit is filed on your behalf. Thank you.